Let me get you back into your New Testaments again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you wouldn't mind, I want to read with you beginning in about verse 35, looking at several things moving throughout the rest of that chapter. If you were with us in our study this morning, you know that we spent most of our time in those first 34 verses. We saw that the gospel is linked to the resurrection of Jesus. There are intense reasons to believe in that resurrection. There are consequences if it is not true and great assurances if it is. But if it is true to you, then it ought to transform your life on a daily level and in the way that you live and the friends that you choose. And we went through all that today. This evening, we're in verse 35 with, I think, a pretty interesting question. There are still a lot of people debating this today, even members of the church and preacher friends about what the resurrection will be like. Let's say you and I are all in. We believe Jesus is going to come back and he does come back and he brings all the saved with him and we instantly are changed and we join the Lord and the eternal afterlife begins. What is it going to look like? What are you going to look like? Will you look like you and your prime? How does that work? Will you live here on this earth? There's all kinds of questions about that. And that's kind of verse 35. Someone will say, how are the dead raised? And particularly with what kind of body do they come? In fact, I will tell you that I have friends pretty close to me who are believing in this concept kind of called the new heaven, new earth idea. This idea that God is going to restore the earth back into the form of of Eden, like the Garden of Eden, where there's no sin and you'll be here and I'll be here and it'll have sort of matter and energy and you'll be in some form of a body not entirely unlike the one that you have. And there's a lot going into that argument and prophecy and all kinds of things. And it will probably shock about half the room when I tell you this. But I actually have like the most traditional conservative view on this. I don't I don't see that. I I don't I I see why we hit those things. And I'm going to go ahead and keep working on my golf game just in case. But I, I just when you go to first Corinthians 15 and the question is directly asked, all of the different answers that were given lead you to Jonathan, the song that he led about leaving the temporal and the physical and the limited and being immortally arrayed. So here's what we're going to do to begin. This could not be simpler. I've got basic black and white slides because I have a little thing on the second and last slide that needed a white background. But I'm just going to go through these one at a time with you and ask you to read along with me. This is what I think that I know. This is one of those categories with I, which I hope the only thing you see here is what you see here. Because I have difficulty going any farther into the future into a place that we cannot see. But let me start with this. The Bible teaches that in the resurrection, God will give you a different, not like the one you have now, unique spiritual body. Begin with me in verse 36. You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body just as he wishes. And to each of the seeds, a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and one flesh of beasts and another flesh of birds and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one. And the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For stars differ from star in glory. In other words, every body that God creates is unique. We know that we have an eternal soul within us. And when we die, we shed this body. If Jesus came back right now, we would shed this body. Our eternal souls would be given a new body. And it seems to be in this text, he's saying, the new body will not be like that body. It will be as different as a seed is to the stalk of wheat that grows. The stalk of wheat may have come from it or connected somehow to it, but it is transformed into something utterly different. This text to me is very comforting to those who have a lot of pain in their body who have never had a prime of life. You know, it's easy to argue that you get to live here on a restored earth in your prime physical health, but what if you never had a prime physical health? What is going to be raised is different than the body you now have, and I think praise God for that. That would be my attitude about that. I've always found it difficult to assess how we would live here on this earth in the body, in the flesh, without sin anyway. 
It will be unique and it will be spiritual. As we'll see as we move forward here, different as God sees fit. It will be eternal. And that's a big difference in the body you now have. Everybody here understands that. It will be eternal. And the text says it will be raised in glory and in power by God's glory and God's power. But also it seems to me that your body will have some measure of glory and power that it does not presently have. Look at these next three verses. So also verse 42 is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So you see that compared to the life you have now, the body that you will receive has honor, it has glory, it has power, it is eternal in nature, it is not physical. Of this I'm certain, it is not physical. It is in fact explicitly said to be a spiritual body. How much better is it going to be? Well, the text actually compares Adam to Jesus to try to get you to see how much better it's going to be. You need to be very optimistic about the body that you're going to receive and the way that it will service your needs for all eternity in heaven. Listen to the text of verses 45 and following. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth. Adam, he's earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, verse 48, so also are those who are heavenly. Which leads to our next point. I'll put them together. It will bear the image of the heavenly. I would say there's a pretty significant difference between Adam and Jesus. Adam was limited. He made mistakes. He suffered consequences, you know, like you, in your flesh, in your body. But the body that is coming, what God will give you is less like Adam and more like Jesus. In that way, it is greater, it comes second, it is life-giving and spiritual. And here in verse 48, we already read that, verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. It will bear the image of the heavenly. I don't know what that means. Does it mean that whatever form God is in, you will be in a similar form? In some ways, I think the answer would be yes, and that we'll all dwell in the same place. Will we look the same in that way? We don't have those answers. But what you need to know as you live in the flesh is what is better is not here. I don't believe that it is. It's not this body. It suffers none of these limitations. It is better and greater in every way. In fact, if there is a restored earth, it would have to switch to a spiritually based restoration. The perishable cannot take on the imperishable. Verse 50, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. What he means here by kingdom of God, since you and I are already in the kingdom of God, is when the fullness of the kingdom of God comes, when heaven comes, when our eternal place comes, flesh and blood will not be able to be there. And I think that's important for multiple reasons. One I've already stated. You will not be suffering the limitations of your body. We will not compare with one another how we look and prize some as more blessed than others. That's one of the obvious points. But secondly, nothing physical in your life is going to be there. Do you get that? Nothing physical. Not your clothes, not your home, not your vehicle, not your golf clubs. Nothing that is carnal, that is earthy, that rusts that is limited will be there. There'll be no flesh and blood there, only spiritual bodies in amazement. This is going to happen very, very quickly. For those who have gone, they are in a place, the Bible appears to teach that they are in a place without bodies right now. They left their physical body in the ground and their souls are in a collected place. We call that like the Hadean realm or paradise. And they will come back and God will give them that body that they don't already have. And God will give you that body and it will happen in an instant. Verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. This will happen in an instant and all that is here will be gone. To me, that just helps with materialism. It helps with this idea of connecting too much of who you are with that which you know will be burned up. 
It helps us to put more focus on our spiritual fellowship that we have and on our relationship with God and on what we want in the future. And in America, we need more focus on the imperishable. We have too many perishable things around us that have become invaluable to us. And this text may break us free of that. It's going to be amazing. Verses 53 through 57, Satan, sin, and death will be defeated forever. A young lady came and talked to me after services today, and she was asking about this idea of how Jesus reigns in heaven. And if Jesus is reigning like we studied this morning, how is it that Satan's still out here doing all of the stuff that he's doing? Well, the Bible said earlier in verse 26 that when Jesus comes back again, when he comes back the final time, that is when death will be abolished. So right now, while you live on this earth, you are subject to death because you are subject to sin, because you are subject to Satan. So Satan, sin and death continue to be allowed to move about and do their worst. But a day is coming in verse 53. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality but when this perishable will I put on the imperishable and this mortal will I put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's this thing called faith that's really important because when Jesus comes back, we're going to know all that. When Jesus comes back, you're going to see the devil put away forever. You're going to see sin eradicated from your existence forever. You're going to see death completely dismantled, never to be suffered again. You will be in a spiritual body, a glorious body, an eternal body. And it's all going to be amazing. You're going to, if you like to sing now in heaven, you're going to be able to sing and your voice never get tired. You're going to be able to praise God forever. But now we don't get that body yet. So I have to live in a body that does get tired that is subjected to futility, that is not always in a place that feels well or lasts long enough. It's called faith. We live for a moment when Satan, sin, and death will be defeated forever. In fact, for us, it's as good as done already. And we're just living out our faith. And this is where this all goes in verse 58. Therefore, as a result of everything that you've read here, and I know I haven't given you anything insightful pertaining to what your body will be like or even exactly where it will exist in the spiritual realm, can only state what's in the text itself. But what you have been provided here is supposed to mean something to you. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Now, we're going to get to this tonight for a few minutes, but some of the toil that went along with being a Christian in their time was very hurtful to their bodies. For the sake of standing for the truth, they may be martyred and their lives ended. Paul had stripes all over his back for the thing which he was suffering. The idea that we're going to get it all and live a great, comfortable, long life here and enjoy all the best things and then I guess trade it in for something a little bit better is ridiculous. What is coming is so much better than anything that you can build or imagine in this place. And sometimes trying to have the best of both worlds is going to cost us the second one. The toil that you have to say is not in vain is a road of struggle. It's a road of standing up for what's right. It's a road of ridicule and persecution. Second Timothy three says all who desire to live godly will be what? Persecuted. Your toil is not in vain. Stand steadfast. So I wanted to present that to you as just a very basic Bible answer and where I continue to stand on what is coming. It's very comforting to me and spiritual. And I think we're all just going to be really amazed. But I want to show you something else. There is a chapter in 2 Corinthians that goes hand in hand with this. And it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So would you look over there with me? Same kind of idea, except much like we tried to do in the second half of this morning's lesson, it kind of infuses it with very practical things for you. If you believe everything that you see here, and I trust that you do, I mean, you may interpret the details of it a little bit differently or what it's all going to look like or whatever, but basically you, you believe this. If so, then there ought to be some truths about your life. It's a lot like this morning. If you believe in the resurrection of the dead, then die with Christ in baptism, die daily in his service and die confidently at the end of your days, knowing that you will be raised. There's things that we do. So Second Corinthians to me shows that. And I found something in my reading this last week that I want to present to you. I drew one of these in my Bible margin, a circle like this with five arrows on it. 
And I wrote, well, I didn't have to write 2 Corinthians 4 and 5 because that's where the text was, but I wrote resurrection faith in action. What is the faith like? How does it live and move if we really believe all this and we're ready to look past the present into the eternal? And the reason I have it in a circle is I think it all connects. No matter where you end up on this circle tonight, wherever you're struggling, the thing behind you will help you and the thing in front of you will tell you where to go next. Let me show you what I'm talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's do this together. This is very similar to what we just read, links the two texts together. We are anticipating a new body. Let's read about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, Longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Great verse. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the spirit as a pledge. That's a great text and we won't spend all night in it, but it pictures your life now, no matter how good it is now, no matter how good you feel in the body or how well everything's going for you, you are in a tent, not a house. You are naked, not clothed. You are not anywhere near the glory of what God is planning. Many people in the room tonight are groaning, verse 2. They are burdened, verse 4. Life is difficult in the flesh. But I anticipate a new body. That when this earthly tent is torn down, now in their day it may have been torn down by whips or animals or guillotines or any number of things. Or they may have died in some natural way. But however this body goes, I have a new body from God A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Okay, so that's the same point we just saw in 1 Corinthians 15. It's just made here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So what? Well, if you believe that, then it's time to be courageous. If you really believe that when this life is over, that one is coming. If you really believe that this isn't all there is and it's not even worth living for, and if you sacrifice this in his name, it will only bring you more quickly to that which is coming, then we ought to be incredibly confident and courageous. Look in verses 6 through 8. Therefore, as a result of what you just read, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Now, there's a lot of points we can make about being courageous, standing up for the truth, being moral in an immoral world, sharing the gospel. But I just like the basic idea of walking around knowing that I'm just I'm just trying to get to heaven. And I am. You know what? I'm going to do the best I can here. I like it here. I live in Texas, best place in the world. Got a lot of good things going on. But as long as I'm here, all I can think about is where I am not. I am not with the Lord. Not in a real, spiritual, eye-to-eye way. This is not the better life for me. And so you walk around with a lot of courage. Because you know that no matter what happens here, when this ends, it only gets better. As opposed to that passage we read this morning in 1 Corinthians 15 where it says, if there's no resurrection, then you may as well eat and drink and die. It doesn't matter. Go make the most out of your life. I don't need to make the most out of this life because this life isn't as good as it's ever going to get. And I don't have to try to make it so. It reminded me of another passage that uses the same word. Hold your finger here in 2 Corinthians 5. Head over to Hebrews 13 for just a moment, verses 5 and 6. It uses the word confidence, same word that you have here about living with this sense of, I get it. I know who I am. I know why I'm here. I know where I'm going. And I know how to use this body to get there. In Hebrews chapter 13, I like verses 5 and 6. Make sure that your character, Hebrews 13, 5, is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Now, I like the courage of that. You say, well, man can do a lot to you. They could take away the things that you have. 
They can hurt your body. They can end your life. Listen to me carefully. The Lord is with me. The Lord is watching over me. And if they take my life, he restores it. He restores it in an instant and he gives it a beautiful eternal presence. And that gives us confidence to say what we need to say. But I don't know, to me, courage is maybe less about valiantly standing on the front line in verse five, just about learning how to be content. I'm convinced that in our time, there's far less of, are we going to join the fight that's going to cost us our freedom? More, it's, are you going to join the fight at the expense of pursuing every little thing that you can get in this life? There is a vast amount of discontentment even among God's own people. Get more, earn more, buy more, have more, do more. Live with courage. You're already living for the greatest blessing that's ever come. And please don't let a lack of contentment here cause you to miss out on that. I'm anticipating a new body. This is a great to, grace to faith to life intro of this circle. The grace is you've been offered a new eternal body. The faith is I have courage and confidence and contentment. Courage, confidence and contentment. Well, what should I do with it? What's that supposed to look like on a Thursday? Well, it means that I should be striving to please God with my body. Striving to please him. Go back to our text, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're just reading along. Verses 1 through 5, we're anticipating a new body. We're naked until we receive it. We want it more than anything. So verses 6 through 8, I'm going to walk by faith. I believe it is so. I'm going to realize I'm never truly where I want to be until I get to heaven. And then verse 9, therefore, as a result of that, notice all these therefores. That's what links some of these points together. Verse 6, therefore, now verse, verse 9. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. If I believe that God alone is going to give me a new eternal body and that lives in my heart is confidence of purpose and confidence and contentment, then I'm going to do everything I can to please God with my life. If I am not doing everything I can to please God with my life, if I am not using my body to honor him, then I do not believe the truth about what God is going to do. And it's going to be shown in my choices. He said, look, one day you're going to appear before the Lord. I think I've told you guys this story before when I did a lesson a few years ago on tents and houses. Tent, house. Tent is the body you have now. House is the body that is coming. I don't, I don't do tents. I think you guys know that. I don't camp in tents. I don't get it. There's why, but anyway. But you know, if a tent's all you had, a tent would be all that you had. But if you're in a tent, you'd probably be interested in these things called houses. They're pretty cool. They have all the stuff. And you want to get from a tent to a house. And imagine that you went to a bank to borrow money and said, I need money to go and buy a house. Otherwise, I'm going to be also without a wife. And they said, OK, cool. Go get your tent. I want to take a look at it. And I'd be like, I don't I don't really want to show you my tent. Well, why not? Well, what does it matter? What does it matter what I do with my tent? It's a tent. The thing is terrible. It barely works. Got holes all through it. It's a mess. That's why I'm trying to get out of it. I want a body. And the guy goes, go show me your tent. Because if you can't take care of a tent, I'm not going to give you the money for a house. Would that be a reasonable thing for a loan officer to say? You know what this is saying? It's saying one day in the judgment, Jesus is going to be like, I want to talk about the way you used your body. You're not going to want to talk about that. You're going to be like, Jesus, that's done. My body and where I went with it and what I did with it and who I was with with it. Oh, like what I put into it, how I use That's all, God, that's, that's tent stuff. Just give me the house. I want the eternal body. He's going to be like, we got to talk about that tent. Because if you couldn't on this earth be faithful in that simple, little, dishonorable tent. And I don't think I'm going to be able to give you the glorious house to come. I want you to know that is exactly what's going to happen. And that's what verses 9 and 10 are saying. That I need to be pleasing to God. For in the judgment seat, he's going to be like, let's talk about your body and see what you have done with it. If you truly believe that the ultimate upgrade is coming, and for some of us, it's closer than we even realize, then use this for him. Use it up for him. Let's go to Romans 12 for just a second. We'll be right back. Romans chapter 12, I like it because it talks about the body. We read it this morning, but also there's this, this idea of pleasing God. The same word is used twice here as the pleasing word that you saw in the text that we just read. Look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. Let me read it and I'll make a comment. Therefore, I urge 
you, brethren, Romans 12, 1, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, present your bodies, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable, that's our word, pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, and here's our word again, pleasing or acceptable and perfect. Here's the way it's supposed to go. In your body, God's will is supposed to be pleasing to you. That's verse two. God wants to control your body. He wants to control where you go with it, what you do with it, how you use it. You probably don't want him to do that. A lot of people don't want him to do that. Verse two says, I am pleased to let the word of God rule my body so that verse one, my body can be pleasing in the life I live in it for him. You know, it's hard to do that first thing without that second thing. I know it's another lesson, but it's really hard to live this life to his honor if you don't believe that the instruction found here is the best thing for your body. Best thing for my body, live for him. So that's our third thing here in Romans 12 is very helpful to that. I anticipate a new body. I'm living with courage and confidence in that. And the life part is striving to please God. But it's not just about me. I really want more people to know about this. That we call this evangelism. We call it sharing the truth. We've got some terrific evangelists in this room tonight and who are members of this church. People who are constantly sharing the gospel of reconciliation, of bringing you back with a world that needs it. There's so many people out there trying to make glory out of a non-glorious body and they're failing over and over again because you can't succeed. We need to be the ones who give them the true and abiding message. Go back to 2 Corinthians 5. I'll read a slightly longer text. It's basically about Paul's mission. But again, we want to try to imitate him. I want to become more like him. So read verses 11 down through the bottom. Therefore, there it is again. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. Verse 14, the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died and he died for all. So that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Verse 16. Therefore, from now on, recognize no one according to the flesh. He goes on to say in verse 18. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us. Now, this is the apostles here. But I want to become more like this. And I think it's God's mission for us all to become more like this. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Your version may say something different. Circle it no matter what it says. God gave us a reconciliation. He reconciled you. He brought you back. He restored your purpose. He's infused you with promises. Now go on the same missions of mercy. The ministry of reconciliation. Namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not counting their trespasses against them, he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's what they do in their mission. They beg people, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sent on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I know that our ministry is not the apostolic ministry, but if this is as great to you as we sing that it is, explain to me why we aren't telling more people about it. I, I forgot the magician or comedian or kind of like an agnostic guy I was listening to the other day or reading about or something, and he said the cruelest thing that I've ever seen in this world is a Christian who won't share their faith. The cruelest thing. What do you mean? I mean, they think they've got the thing. They think they've got the greatest, most important, most absolutely valuable, most promise-filled. They have the thing that changes everything. Is there anything more despicable than someone having everything that's anything and not sharing it with everybody? That hurt a little bit when I read that. Maybe I don't believe it like I should. If I was saturated with belief in this, who would I not tell? How could I be silenced? Ambassadors of Christ. There's some great passages for that that talk about that, about trying to free the world. We have Matthew 5 being a light that tries to bring people into a relationship with God so that they can be a glory to him. But they can't be a glory to them unless you tell them what's there. And maybe we can re-up those efforts. We've got so many people here who are really good at it. Now, here's the thing, though, and this is where it cycles back. 
goes back to chapter four. We're going to make a circle. If we really stand up courageously for what we believe in, we're not rude or unkind, we're very loving, but truth is not accepted in a world that loves itself. So if we go and we try to convince people to go to church, and we try to convince them to do what right, then there is a very strong chance that we may endure actual affliction. The real stuff. Not somebody blocking you on social media. That's probably a gift. I mean, actual ridicule. I'm not talking about people talking bad about you and you never know about it. Who cares? I'm talking about actual ridicule. What if Christianity cost us something? Now, for us, that's very difficult. I, I don't, not for everyone, and I don't want to overstate. But for us in general, that's very difficult to accept. But, you know, we talk all the time about being first, first century Christians. We're first century Christians. We're living the Christian life just like first century Christians. They lived in a godless world. We live in a godless world. They got persecuted all the time. I can't remember the last time I faced any turmoil for what I believe, except for a few things that get recorded and someone hears about. Somehow this has got to become so real that we're willing to lose some people to save some people. I don't want to get comfortable doing nothing. Let me show you the text. I'll just back up to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. This is the apostles again, but he's linking it to a lot of what happened with many of the Christians, actually. But we have this treasure, and the treasure is that gospel we talked about this morning. In fact, verse 3 says the word gospel. It's the message of Jesus. We have this treasure, the message of his death, burial, and resurrection, salvation in him, grace in which we stand, eternal spiritual body. He said we have this great treasure, this unbelievable treasure, in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God, not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Always, listen carefully, always caring about in the body, the dying of Jesus. Remember what we said this morning? Who remembers the three word phrase from this morning? I die daily. Remember that? I was setting you up for this. I die. You mean I die daily. I mean, we're out there telling people about Jesus. We're sharing the gospel truth. We're standing for what's right. It means we get affliction, verse 8. Sometimes we get perplexed. Sometimes we get persecuted. Sometimes we get struck down. But we are always caring about in this thing, in the tent, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Remember what I ended with this morning, the idea of he doesn't just want to die and be buried and raised. He wants you to experience a fellowship with his death, burial, and resurrection. He wants you to experience life like his life. And so when we are treated poorly, when we are sent away, when something is done to hurt us, it is no different than the Jesus Christ whom we serve. And so it is again, verse 11. We're being delivered over for Jesus' sake so that the life of Christ also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, he says, but life in you. That sounds hard. How am I going to do that? I don't know. I can think of a few instances this week where I need to be a bit more bold and I need to be a bit more um, conversational and I need to say the things that need to be said and I want to hand out more cards and I want to push a few more buttons. Uh, it's not all t-shirts. I know Jonathan's not a big t-shirt fan, but I did wear the I Am Rahab t-shirt to the airport this week. Someone at a meeting last week, I said, I'm getting I Am Rahab t-shirts for everyone. And someone made me one and I wore it to the airport. And that was really, really interesting. There was a girl in front of me in line on the, going into the airplane. And I saw her phone and she was Googling Old Testament female. Like she couldn't quite pinpoint it, but she was trying to figure it out. I had a couple of good conversations. I'm not talking about t-shirts. I'm just talking about like really living like this isn't all there is. You're going to stand out like crazy if you do that. Your work, sports, all that stuff. And people aren't going to like it if your choices cost them. You see that all through the book of Acts. How are we going to do it? Well, there it is. It comes right back around. Everything here is connected. I endure affliction because I'm anticipating a new body. When I learn about that new body, it gives me more courage, a lot of sustenance and strength. It makes me want to go out and use this body to please God and tell other people about it. And every time I do that, something happens and it feels like a slap in the face. But you know what? I'm not going to quit. You know why? Because I'm anticipating a new body. 
And that new body gives me a lot of courage. And I go out and I try to please God and I tell somebody else about it. And it goes great until somebody just doesn't want to hear it. And, and you know what I do? I anticipate I could go all night. I could just keep going. You let me know when you're tired of it. All these things keep fueling them. Listen to the rest of the text and we'll quit. Verses 13 through 18. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe. We also believe. Therefore we also speak. We believe, so we speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sake so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound in the glory of God. Exactly what we just talked about. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day for momentary light affliction. It was not momentary nor light what he faced. But in comparison, it was. He said, momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, your body now, but the things which are not seen are eternal, your body that is coming. I'm encouraged by that. God's grace is all over my life in the promises of what is to come. And the further along we age, the more difficult it is to face our own mortality. But if it's not the end, we face it with courage. And I pray that you know that. Pick your spot on this cycle. I've printed this up in the back. Take it home, please. Spend some time with it this week. Use the things that are going on there to get you to the next thing and keep coming back to the promises of God. His promises and His power sustain us. And maybe one day we'll all together, when Jesus comes, Experience what life has been about the whole time. Don't wait till then to know it. It'll be too late. Live by faith and know it now. If we can help you and encourage you, come now as we stand and sing.